Bob Shikoshis is the 2014 winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for his book, The Woman Who Lost Her Soul, which was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He's won the National Book Award for first work of fiction for his short story collection, Easy in the Islands, and his 1993 novel, Swimming in the Volcano, was also a finalist for the National Book Award. Whether he's writing novels or covering wars, Bob is a literary and journalistic force, and we are so thrilled to have him back to introduce Richard S. Powers, the 2019 Dayton Literary Peace Prize fiction runner-up for the overstory. Bob? I'm sorry, I feel very inadequate, and I feel uh, like you probably feel, I think, uh, emotionally exhausted. Um, and I always feel that way at, at this point when I have to come up at the podium at Dayton. And I want to salute the citizens of Dayton who do this. I, I, I don't understand. I, re I really don't. This is really demanding of you, and you come here and do this year after year. It's what writers make themselves do. We don't really expect to have a whole community doing this. And you are extraordinary to come and support one of the great visionaries in American culture and her vision of what a community should be, Sharon. You're amazing. I, I, I'm just amazed. I don't know anything else like this in America. It, it, it moves me, for sure. I want to just spend one second um, saying in the literary, saying something to Scott Mamaday. In the literary village, you have many, many children, father, and your children, thank you very much. Thank you. So, okay, <laughs> Richard Powers and I have been friends for a very, very long time. We've had uh, a journey that uh, I think constantly might, uh, constantly surprises us. Um, in 1993, for instance, um, at the National Book Awards then, Richard and I were finalists, so was Annie Prue, who ended up winning it. And uh, Richard's publisher would not pay for him uh, to come to New York City and have a hotel room. So Richard slept on our couch at the Dorset Hotel. That's how long Richard and I have known each other. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and peeking in on him and seeing his, he was on the couch and seeing from the mid-shin down to the bottom of his feet were hanging over the end of the couch. And I thought to myself, I bet Richard uh, swore to himself to never stop growing until it was officially confirmed that he was two inches taller than the very tall Annie Prue, who ended up winning the National Book Award that year. But in 1991, his third novel was published. It was called The Gold Bug Variations. And not so long after that, um, I was being interviewed by somebody, I, I don't know who. And when I was asked by that interviewer who my favorite uh, writer was, uh, I need to have the category. So living dead, okay, living. American or global, American. Okay, who's my favorite living American writer? I don't really want to answer that question. Uh, one of the reasons I don't want to answer it is because uh, I'm too aware of who I leave out by answering that question. And I said to the interviewer, I have plenty of favorites. And he said, come on, uh, pick one. And I said, okay, um, well, it's someone you don't know, someone you probably never heard of, a guy named Richard Powers. And uh, that would still might be my answer today. The only difference being, of course, Richard, it seems that folks, millions of them, 
have finally heard of you, and I'll mend to that. So I don't know whether or not uh, brevity is a virtue, but I've been asked to embrace it tonight, and I, and I, and I will. But I still want to say what those people, those millions of them have heard about Richard is true. The scale and scope and spectrum of Richard Powers' work are, and I mean this, and I think about this a lot, and I want to know who matches up. They're unequaled. His novels are expansive mansions, each room inhabited with human endeavor and the extraordinary mechanics of human existence. And in the case of the Oberstory, non-human existence. Mass communication, sure. Nuclear war warfare, sure. Sandhill cranes and neurology, check. Bioterrorism and the nature of happiness, well, why not? <laughs> Pediatrics, corporate influence, artificial intelligence, and mus musical composition. Composition, sure, check, yes, sir. Storytelling, you bet. Again and again, bright, brilliant blazes of story and character, of drama and heart. Everything on the planet seems to be an element or an essence of powers, aesthetic. On the page I've written, vision, and I crossed that out and put hunger, and then I crossed that out and said, insatiable appetite. He is a black hole of aesthetic grabbing at the world. Everything goes in there, and everything comes out in the most brilliant fashion. Everything is a force, brains, forest, genetics, coding, a force transmitting energy and information through and into some larger system. He's both a composer and an illuminator of intricate patterns, which makes him a type of literary physicist. And there are not any other ones out there who can be described that way. It makes he's, that his metaphorical and, rep, and metaphysical repetition, repetition, sorry, the point us they point us beyond the veil of things in the most extraordinary way because most novels point us inward. His do that, but they also point us outward to a horizon that is hard to fathom. His work is composed of unlikely fugues that braid disparate perspectives into a unified vision, and ultimately that is what is so damn remarkable about the artist Richard Powers. He's a, matter, a master of juxtaposed realities and parallel but contrapuntal narratives that finally and miraculously create, like America herself, as chaotic and polarized as we are, create both an eerie and awkward and yet surprisingly transcendent sense of oneness. And that's where we have to go. And that's where Richard work, Richard's work tries so hard to push us toward. So amen to that as well. Please welcome Richard Powers. <laughs> old friend, my old friend Richard Powers. Bless you, Bob, for the incredibly gracious and generous introduction. You made me nostalgic for the days of sleeping on couches <laughs> with literary awards. I do get beds these days. My feet still, still stick over the end of them, I'm afraid. My, and I do also want to thank Sharon for this extraordinary young sequoia that you've grown from seed. My thanks go out to all the founders and executors of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, 
who have created an award of real value by treating books as a part of a larger community of human commitment. I've long believed that literature cannot afford to retreat into mere aesthetics and private psychology, but must place the stories of individuals into larger narratives of collective meaning and communal survival. That's why this recognition by judges who are charged to read for social purpose is especially satisfying. For a long time, we writers in the European tradition have focused the lens of fiction almost exclusively on ourselves. The non-human world, as we told it, was no longer part of the human drama. The living earth had been subdued. We were its ascendant masters, and as in every efficient colonial system, all the rich and intricate communities that were subjugated in the making of empire got reduced to invisible commodities. Now we find that our war to replace community with commodity far from being one, is about to rout us. The planet's living systems are in upheaval. The creatures that have shored us up and underwritten us are vanishing. More than 6,000 species have gone extinct since my book was published last year. In the time it takes me to say even these few words, we will have lost another 100 football fields of primary forest. And no human being has ever seen the complexity and diversity and richness of an old growth forest return from a clear cut. If you want peace, the old saying goes, work for justice. Environmental justice and social justice are one and the same. Two thirds of the species of the earth are under the care of indigenous people. And when a species disappears, when a forest is plowed under for pasture or goes up in flames, those caretakers of the few remaining fragments of healthy earth are the ones who suffer most. In the best fiction, drama depends on turning conflict to the uses of kinship. To see trees as, an unfolding, as characters in an unfolding narrative of creation is to think of the world on tree time. The Anthropocene is the smallest present moment and who knows how long it will last. We humans have been around for a mere 200,000 years. Trees have been around 2,000 times that long. They have survived four major mass extinctions and they will survive whatever extinction we throw at them. We must recover and rehabilitate our ancient pact with them if we mean to stay around much longer. Breathe the air, Thoreau says. Drink the drink, taste the fruits. Live in each season as it passes. Resign yourself to the influence of the earth. Remembering how to do that will be among the hardest things we humans have ever done. But difficulty can bring out the best in our species. And such a resignation could give more meaning to our lives than private accumulation has ever offered. In all our best first stories, from the Ramayana to Ovid, to the tales of our continent's 500 First Nations, the refrain is always the same. Our fate is tied 
to the fate of the neighbors. We and they are not separate. It is time for our stories to turn commodity back into community. It has been the gravest mistake of humanity to go to war with the rest of creation. And it would be the greatest story imaginable for us to stand down, make peace with the community of life, and find our way back home.